morning, earlier I talked talk to you about uh, how I started right out of college and a number of surprises were thrown to me. <clears throat> One of the earliest surprises was Mr. Jordan's announcement that he was going to retire. <clears throat> he, he had done his time and he wanted to sell to uh, a British firm that FMI, a number of you know who FMI is, <clears throat> has found a publicly traded company that wanted a presence in North America. And through a year-long search, they had uh, targeted the Mid-Atlantic. They wanted an open shop state. They wanted a size that happened to be the size of our company. And lo and behold, we were their selection. So we spent uh, a year uh, investigating what it would take, asked to our employees that we were going to uh, have greater possibilities and capabilities because of the size and deep pockets of the British company. And um, I played a good soldier and, and answered a lot of uh, employees' uh, questions because they were uncertain, didn't know where they needed to look for a job, didn't know how it was going to be. And uh, I started, at, I was still managing projects at the time, and a really good uh, friend of mine was the CEO for Ferguson Enterprises. I'm sure most of you know them. And they had just been bought by a British company the year before, Wolsey. And so I asked the, the CEO to, to join me on a, a trip to one of the one's big projects I was managing, some of the places golf afterwards. I said, tell me how it went. And he said, well, he said, we're not going to make any changes whatsoever. He says, that's the reason we bought you, because you're so profitable, you've got a good corporate culture, um, you're the leader in your field, and so forth. And I said, well, how did it go? He said, don't believe it. He said, when they got their money in it, they're going to they're gonna change what you do. And uh, so I thought about it for a second. And uh, the mechanical contractor that, that uh, was the largest in our area was, you know, was a good friend of mine. We were attorney brothers here at Tech, uh, his family. And so I asked him the next week, would you write up to me? I want to know how in the world did you, did you bought out your 50% partner. And he said, it's something called leverage buyout. And he said, that's when you take half the assets of the corporation, you give it to the 50% uh, owner, and then you go and convince five companies, banks, and insurance companies that with 50% less uh, on your balance sheet, you, uh, they, they, they need to let you do twice as much work so you can pay, pay everybody back. It's the real sell job. So lo and behold, uh, I went and saw my dad at 5 o'clock the next Monday morning and said, you know, don't shoot me, but what do you think if we bought the company out? Pay the same price that we spent a year, and they ended up doubling the price in that year by hiring some salts to uh, run the numbers up. He looked at me and he says, I don't know what he's going to hit me or what. He says, I've always believed in you. I don't want to sell the company. Let's go do it. I said, Dad, you got to understand. You have all cash, but if you decide for us to buy the company from the British, in from the partner instead of going to the British, you'll have to co-sign on all the loans and you could lose everything that you've got. But I'm not worried. We'll do it. I was 31 years old. <laughs> and Mr. Jordan ran the office and I had come in the office recently after being out in the field. And so the new, under the new structure, my dad would run all the field projects or be in charge of them all and I would run the company at 31 years old. We made the entire purchase price back in the bush. And we took our revenue to 250% of what we did the previous year. Sometimes you need to be a little scared of what might happen to, to force you to have a laser focus on the things that can happen. And the other thing, you need, you need friends. You need help. And I found in this business, you're selling yourself every single day. You're always, everybody is in sales, and you're, and how you can convince other people to come along in, uh, under your leadership or in your direction will make a huge difference in your life. And it did, in mine, I don't know where I would be today if I hadn't been working on Saturday, I worked every Saturday, 18 years, seven days a week, and I always went and got the mail on Saturday, and there was the letter of intent, onion skin, air mail envelope. I, the, the week before, I 
talked to my dad about uh, us buying him out. I locked that in my drawer. I finished all the due diligence. And um, that's how I ended up here today. So things go along pretty good. 1992, it was one of these epiphanies. I, I look around and say, you know, we're not really giving our customers the best product that we should. We can do better than what we're doing uh, right now. And I couldn't put my finger on why. And then I realized that we're probably like a lot of, of my competitors, we're, fo we're focusing on profit for our business model. And you know, that's a real impure objective. And it's really not about profit. It's about all the various processes that you go through to create this fabulous team on every job, a completely different team, and it's a completely different project, whatever. And so I thought to myself, what would it be like if we made our business model objective leverage and efficiency? Two words, real simple, leverage and efficiency. How can we eliminate waste? How can we get better productivity? How can we leverage our people resources, our capital resources, our equipment resources? You know, what would the effectiveness of a business model is based on that? Well, everybody that worked for us was always focused on profit. And so I had to change our mindset of an entire company. That is not easy to do. It takes years to go in a completely different direction. Because because we are creatures of habit. And back then, constru constructing companies are about as conservative as you get in the various business models you have in different industries. I realized also that when I hired people that worked for other companies, it was hard to change them. They, they just didn't understand um, why the superintendents, and even to today, do not answer to the, to the project managers. They answer to general superintendents that are just the CEO. The project manager in our business model, his sole responsibility is to make life as easy as he can to help the superintendent. And we give full authority to the superintendents that they can obligate the company to change the schedule, change the price, they can sign any document, and because of that, uh, and they're at the point of contact where it happens uh, in the field. And so this wasn't going to be easy. And the people I've been hiring from other companies just took a long time to come around. So that's when we you know, figured out the first part of changing our brand and culture, intern program. We're going to grow them. We're not, we're not going to go out and, and uh, steal them or, or convince them to, to leave another company. We're going to grow them from scratch because they won't know anything else. The only thing they will ever know is our culture and our brain. And so, and it was a minute that we made some mistakes up front. And um, uh, one of the things that, that uh, uh, implemented was to say, we're going to put these kids on salary. We're not going to pay them by the hour. I don't want them watching the clocks. I want them to be task oriented. If they can get it done in, in uh, less than eight hours, that's great. If it takes 12, that's tough. But that's the way the real world is. So we're going to start you on salary, and we're going to assign a mentor to you, and we're going to have mentor training so that when the intern starts, he's got somebody he can rely on uh, for, for guidance and questions. And um, you're not going to be using a, a, a broom and a shovel. You're, you're going to have real responsibility. And uh, if we invite you back, we'll give you a raise and increase responsibility. And by the time uh, that you get to three or four years of interning with the company, you're a real valuable person. I remember back in the 80s when I hired somebody, a micro named the school, it wasn't this one, that uh, had a civil engineering degree and could not read drawings. It took five years to get them to be valuable enough to earn their own salary. And uh, the intern program helped that a lot. And as we have, have developed it through the years, we've added lots of other uh, bells and whistles. We grade them at halftime during the summer, they grade us. We do field trips to manufacturing plants for precasting, mill work, and so forth, so that they can see how the components uh, are made that end up in the buildings that they do. So I'm starting to get better results there, but wasn't even quite close to what it needed to be to change the business model and change the mindset of people who uh, previously hadn't experienced that. <laughs> Started a learning and development center. I mean, huge believer in lifelong learning. I mean, I read five <laughs> newspapers a day. I, 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 I read more than anybody that I know because I'm always trying to learn new things. 
And it's surprising, it doesn't matter what area of life or business that you learn new things with, you can always find some application for the job that you have. So we develop a learning and development center. Uh, and most of everything that I've come up with uh, during my uh, time with W. Jordan comes from daydreaming. You know, going out on the riverbank and, and, and being quiet and just talking about it, thinking to myself, what are the possibilities? And asking lots of questions. So with the Learning and Development Center, I think we'd have two objectives. 50% of the classes that we would teach would be about construction stuff, waterproofing the envelope like we talked about this, this morning, and other things, where to find, where to identify the dew point in the outside uh, envelope wall. Um, the other half, we wanted to be, or I wanted to be on personal development. How can I create self-confidence in these young folks? How can I get them to believe in themselves so strongly that they will be good future leaders, that they will, will be instrumental members of the team, that they will be complete people. And so we started teaching things like um, how to read body language, uh, gamesmanship, um, how to stop identity theft, uh, public speaking, uh, making presentations, but all kinds of interesting things that help them in their personal life, not just their construction life, to not only gain self-confidence, but to be happier at home. Another thing that we decided to do quarterly, which has since changed a couple of years ago, nobody in the company ever has to leave a home for more than one hour. You're always within one hour of your job site, one hour of your office, and you don't have to spend the night out uh, elsewhere. You don't have to travel. The, the theory there is maybe you'll have a better marriage. Maybe you'll have better kids. You get your home more often and you can complain your day. And up until, again, a couple of years ago, that was the case. Nobody traveled. Um, it had changed out when the recession came. That, that made a difference. And so I'm, I'm starting now to get them to, to understand that they're doing things differently. And I'm always able to, to explain why efficiency and leverage are the key objectives. The profits take care of themselves. You do all these other things right, you get rid of waste, the profits take care of themselves. Uh, a number of the construction gurus that I've read, the consensus is about construction 60% efficient. 60% efficient because of bad weather, design changes, owners can't make decisions quick, uh, can't get materials when they're supposed to, you can have strikes more often back in those days than we do now. So it's 60% efficient as opposed to manufacturing, which is 99.5% or 99.8%. How would you like to be in manufacturing? What kind of upside do you have? If I could take 60 to 65%, I win a lot. If I could take 7%, competitors can't come close. So that was the, the reasoning behind that. But still wasn't there yet. I, I'm starting to get some believers and, and didn't do it all at one time either. We started implementing it. The intern program was, was the most important. The rest of the things came after that. Wellness. Decided that we would uh, look at a, in a wellness program that is different than the gyms that we build for the banks that we do and for the corporate uh, buildings that we do. We would have a truly comprehensive wellness program where, uh, because a lot of the buildings that, that we have built and, and Tim and, and uh, Mark have built, you do these great facilities, you come back two or three years later, people aren't in there. They're not using them. 70% of wellness is nutrition. 77% is nutrition. 30% is the physical part. So we decided we're going to do an organic garden. And we're going to teach gardening classes, and we're going to have uh, everybody in the company understand the importance of making the right choices. It doesn't mean you can't slip every now and then, but if you primarily uh, look at, at eating 50% of your diet in fruits and vegetables, you're going to live a lot longer, you're going to feel a lot better, and you're, you're going to not have a weight problem and so forth. So we built an organic garden. We have a full-time um, wellness director who was a personal trainer, certified director. Now we've got four certified directors. And uh, we have individual classes and group classes. And fun things, we mix it up in all kinds of different um, competitions and other things. 
Once a week, we have we have a electronic newsletter that goes out, and, and, and it's surprising how many of our associates send them out to other other companies and other people to share some snippets of really good ideas and recent research that, that comes out. Um, you know, you have to do the whole package to make the thing work properly. I made an announcement to all of our uh, people in all offices. There are no hours for a wellness program. You can leave your desk anytime you want. Whoever you answer to can't tell you to get back and, and, and get this project done that we have a deadline for. You know when you need uh, to put the time in and when you can and can. We want you to have your families here. And we have health care. We're self-insured. We have health care for the entire family. So we want your kids here. We want your spouses here. We want you to use the program and enjoy it. You're going to think that you're going to have less hours, but you're going to be more productive, and that has been the case. They've got more energy, and they're more productive by taking more time off to do a wellness program. We have a huge percentage of the company um, that is is uh, using the program, and it, there's challenges on the, on, the, on the job site. So we do send uh, wellness uh, people to the individual job sites to show them things that can be done in the field office. I love to have fun. I mean, I, and I like to, to make fun of myself and other people, and, and you need to laugh. You know, the, 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 something that really keeps you well and balanced is a good belly laugh on a regular basis. So I figured I'm going to do a fun committee for every office. Every office is going to have a fun committee, and it's comprised of oh, eight or nine people, uh, a mix of, of male and female, some a lot of young, but some older ones too, and they dream up all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, I remember at, at uh, Administrative Assistance Day, um, we had a, an event at the, at the country club, and my assistant had been with me 30 years. We went to the bathroom and we changed clothes. I put on her dress, she put on my suit, and I sat, and I sat on her knee and took dictation from her. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you, you've got to laugh at, at yourself. Well, our fun committee has an activity probably once a week. Uh, most of the time it's, it's involved with uh, a community service project and we, and we either do things for a needy organization or family or we do things that, and raise money to help that uh, that need which is the next thing is community involvement i mean you you cannot be a strong leader you cannot be self-confident you can't be happy in life without giving back to other people and those who are, are fortunate and have, have given, been given good health and good opportunity, you've even got a greater responsibility. So, you know, not only do, do we do things uh, to help charitable organizations, but we populate a lot of nonprofit boards. And um, I remember when I was leading United Way back in the 90s, um, they had this corporate volunteer program where for three months the, the uh, company would lend an executive to any and pay their salary for three months, but they couldn't do any work back at their company or working for United Way. Well, the previous year, they had gotten three companies to each give a person three. And it was from New Purdue Ship Building, the other side hospital, the big boys, you know. And they said, would you, would you uh, come up with a plan to increase that number? And I said, sure. So I went around to all of the, my friend at, at Ferguson, and all of the, the companies I really admired, and talked to the CEO and said, Y'all got a great company, but when you leave, who is the one all-star that you've got that is young folks that are, that are really sharp and can take your place? They're, they love talking about stuff like that. They said, well, Joe Jones, he's going to be the next one. I said, you'll never get there unless he works for my United Way volunteer executive program. So we went from three to 32 in one year. And the amount of good we did was unbelievable. And so I had all the best people. Because they told me that they were the best one, the best one in their company that could take it over. So giving back to the community is 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 huge. Um, trust and responsibility. You know, when you give trust and responsibility, when you empower people at the very lowest levels and you listen to them uh, for all kinds of of uh, suggestions and ideas that they have to help with efficiency and to help with leverage, uh, it's amazing how they take ownership of their position in the company. They feel like it's their company. 
because you've empowered them to do that. Uh, one of the worst things you can do is have a line outside your door and say, I finished what you told me to do. What's next? You know, figure it out yourself. Empowerment is, is, a, is, a, is a big thing. It took probably five years, but we changed the mindset of the entire company. We changed the way people perceive their job to be. And guess what we got in the way of a benefit? We triple our profits. Triple our profits. Without having the object to triple your profits. So uh, within whatever organization you end up in your career um, after you finish school, you know, think about the fact that anything is possible. Because it, it is. It is. And one of the most satisfying things in your career and in life is, is dreaming up something from pure scratch that, that just came from a daydream that becomes reality and is very effective. Really cool. I will talk to you a little bit now about uh, augmented reality. Did you say you wanted to do questions afterwards? Yeah. Or, okay. Um, and we do, our biggest customers are pretty typical. And not many people have, have seen uh, inside the yard, nuclear shipbuild well, because defense related nuclear work, you know, things they don't let most anybody in there. It's pretty strict on security. And uh, but they, they are one of the best users of technology I've ever seen. And you know why? They have one customer and they make essentially one product. I mean, they did some subs, but aircraft carriers is, is their uh, mainstay. And nobody else does nuclear aircraft carriers in the world. So everything that they do, they got, they're the first ones to figure it out. The very first ones. <clears throat> well, I was chair of the board of Mariners Museum at the time, and, and the shipyard always has a standing seat for the president of the yard. And um, I'm real big about varying the location of my various uh, board meetings when I'm chair of the board. So I asked Matt Walmer, where the, where the uh, interference is, but, well, I asked Matt Walmer, would you give us a, a, a tour of the shipyard? Could we have our next board meeting there? Well, he did, and he showed me how they use a new technology called augmented reality. They use it with their welders and, and, and pipe fitters and whatever, so they could see inside the future reactor room and pump room and whatever, before any work is ever done, of the various challenges they'll have with a, a five foot two female sailor having to be able to reach a valve without taking her eyes off of the gauge that that, that valve controls so that it's done right the first time on to come back and redo it. Well, a few months later, uh, we got a visit from uh, their augmented reality group, and they had been working on it for three years, and, and they use it as a real efficient tool. And, uh, and they wanted to have a, a possible spin-off company to be able to apply this technology to building construction. Because construction in ships is different from buildings, but there's a lot of things that are the same. There's a lot of, a lot of things. And so they wanted to use us as a test case. We've been working with them for over a year to do that. And so the first demonstration, I'm having a hard time uh, grasping what augmented reality is. But basically, you're taking virtual reality and you're overlaying it on top of reality. A good example, football. You see the uh, first uh, uh, down line and the scrimmage line, and this is where you got to get to the kick field goal line. That's augmented reality. That's the simplest form of augmented reality I can uh, I can explain. But they're overlaying virtual reality on top of reality. Well, the example that they use uh, is to how they have really increased efficiency. That word keeps popping up in, in uh, aircraft carrier construction concerns how they mount all the equipment, all the furniture in aircraft carriers. They have studs, like a Nelson stud, and it could be half inch, it could be an inch in diameter, six or eight inches long. Hundreds of thousands located all over the ship. And that's what all these monitors are, are hung on, and that's what uh, base cabinets are anchored to with all these studs. That's the first thing that hasn't happened. Well, they're real sophisticated in their schedule. They've got the next 14 activities already scheduled without people waiting in line once that stud's in the right place, then it goes to the next one or the next one. Do-overs kill them. Do-overs so bad. And if, if that stud's off by an eighth of an inch, they got to bring that guy, the welder back in and redo it. So they developed uh, an app 
that is on the Apple Store. And uh, where's Brent? You might pass around a few of the uh, postcards so that they can see. He's going to do a demonstration for you next time we get a break in the back of the room where we can show you how augmented reality is, is used. You use it with your smartphone, you can use it with your tablet, and you hit a target for uh, a particular uh, project or, or room or whatever, and it puts you in a digitized environment so that everything you do is exactly in the right place. Well, they developed this app that they download onto a tablet, and so a welder now pulls his face shield up, hits the target in this control room, to say we're in, and immediately all of the studs appear where exactly where they have to go throughout the entire room. Ceiling, floor, walls, everything. He takes the stud for the next one he's going to do. He goes over with his pad, and the moment it hits exactly the right location, the screen turns green. Welds it shield down, welds it in place, it's perfect. They eliminated 70% of one of the most costly labor items on in aircraft carrier construction by using aug augmented reality. We uh, did a, a demonstration of what this postcard is, and this is workable. It gives you the directions on how to download the, the uh, app from the Apple Store, how to hit the target. You'll see the, you'll see the building rise right out of the postcard of the new indoor football field facility that we're getting just about completed here at Virginia Tech. And that was kind of a demonstration deal to, to uh, wet your whistle and give you a, a, a better concept of what augmented reality is. For the new classroom building, we're, we're bringing the shipyard up here and work with the professors to find a way to make it a construction tool that will give those same types of efficiencies that the shipyard has been able to realize. And it, we're going to try to do it in every room. Uh, we're also look, uh, looking to tech to provide uh, graduate student and faculty support to find out what other possibilities that we haven't found that could uh, be used in future construction. So imagine you going into this room and you've got your pad and you've downloaded, and this room doesn't exist, by the way, at the time. Or maybe just the force lab exists and that's it. And in here, you've, everything that hangs on the wall, FF&E as well as built-in stuff, every switch, Every piece of conduit, everything is exactly where it's going to be. And if you need it to be in a different place, you, you can make that modification uh, in virtual uh, space. And then you walk in the room. And you go and you hang the picture. You put the desk, the podium, whatever. And it tells you exactly where it is. You never, you never touch a measurement tape. Never. No layout involved. And it's right, it's right every single time. And then when you're finished, it's all it's also your as built. So you can point to any wall, you can make the wall go away, you see everything that's behind the wall. So anytime you need to come in and do renovations for repurposing the space, you're not going to be long. You point the it to uh, the facilities people like it. We already do, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm sure Tim and Mark also do for the facilities people as built drawings that gives you in the build model. We point to a, I mean, a mechanical room to a bell and gossip point uh, pump and it says, um, my, ma my serial number so and so, I was manufactured in uh, 2005. I need to have my seals changed every six months. This is the contact phone number of the, of the uh, salesman who sent it to me. Uh, you know, everything that you need to maintain your facility. Well, this takes it even further than that. This gives you uh, a, a much greater uh, database. The, the best comparison that I can, can give you was one that was given to me. He said, Vim and, and a good Vim model to augmented reality is Little League to the New York Yankees. That's how much of a game changer this technology would be. We've all seen the various fads that, that you see in the, in the industry over the years. And you, after we get to be our age, you recognize which ones are fads and which ones are game changers. Vim is a game changer. Augmented reality is a game changer. So enjoy your uh, demonstration when you have a chance, and uh, Rainbow will help you with that. Pretty, pretty neat stuff. Uh, and even though we've been working on it here, uh, the power of many more smart people looking at it also uh, can be incredible. Thank you.